Yeah. Hi, I'm Lisbury. Hi. Hi. Um, so, uh, I'm going to for my IPCCR uh, grant, I was able to go to Belgrade, Serbia, and present uh, some of my research, um, which I'm going to present to you guys on the erotic blues dancing body, which sounds really sexy because it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also was able to go to Berlin and Krakow and participate in some blues dancing exchanges. And so um, part of my project that I'm interested in. Um, how I can theorize about the blues dancing body and uh, slow drag, which is a form of blues dancing, um, and also kind of weave in ethnography, autoethnography. So basically, I'm going to be reading you a paper, but also telling you some stories at the same time. Sound good? Sounds yeah. Great. great. Okay. So to start, I'm interested in the ways in which homemaking and community making take place through blues, and that is to say, how can minoritarian subjects actively make home in their community and in their bodies through social dance? What are the ways in which folks perform intimacy within blues dancing? And is there a possible emancipatory potential of dance culture? And if depression and sexual longing are articulated in blues music and dancing, then can weight sharing, waiting, pulsing sexual subjects generate an erotic vocabulary of movement and a way of connecting to other people while often being viewed as queer or deviant? So to answer these questions, I'm examining the black erotic dancing body alongside the queer dancing body, acknowledging the intersections that are found in many uh, bodies such as my own. I argue that blues as epistemology provides insight into the life worlds of black people in the United States, who out of states of terror have made home and found a means of survival through the erotic. Uh, it is my hope that I can use this present material reality of blues social dancers to interrogate the past and serve liberatory futures. So, in Poland, I was able to go to this event called Hummingbird Blues, a uh, blues dancing exchange in Krakow. Friday and Saturday and Sunday nights, uh, these dances went from 9 o'clock p.m. to about 4 o'clock a.m. Um, the first night, I felt every movement was really tentative and connecting to my partners were really difficult. Um, I discovered in Berlin, uh, as it was in Krakow, that it's customary to dance with a person um, at least two times. So you ask the person to dance, you do two dances, um, and then you move on usually. Um, so someone explained to me that the first dance is about getting to know your partner. The second is actually dancing with them. I felt like this, um, in a way I was dancing with the European Union. The first night was getting to know them and Saturday and Sunday would actually be about embodiment and being present and truly dancing with them. Usually about like three o'clock in the morning I found myself really tired and I began my trek back to the hotel. I had to make my peace with BOMO or the fear of missing out and listen to my body's need for rest and recharging. Jackie Malone builds on pre-existing scholarship, arguing that an embodied knowledge embedded in dance gestures can be and historically has been transferred in social dance forums. She argues that in blues tradition, the dancer visibly responds to the music, and also the way in which they respond offers up information. So consequently, acts of continuous movement through times of ruptured rhythm can be read as a way of surviving in the United States. The repercussions of trauma of systemic oppression, institutional brutality, and slavery are apparent and visible in the everyday lived experiences of black American and in blues music. As activists and dancers look for ways to negotiate and perform responses to these events and parts of cultural memory, this project seeks, <coughs> excuse me, seeks to illuminate the ways in which we perform as erotic dancing bodies a series of interconnected gestures that serve as survival strategies. So for the purposes of this project, I'm looking at um, the slow drag, which is an idiomatic blues dance um, in its historical and contemporary context. So with the hope I'm uh, trans uh, forming a trans-historical analysis of the dance that has always already contained the erotic residue of blues uh, black sexuality. So I propose that for the slow drag, um, that the erotic embodied practice is important in that we only have the remnants in our body and little in our archival record. There are not uh, many documentaries that feature uh, blues dancing bodies. We have a lot of blues music, um, but not a lot of blues dancing. Mm -hmm. So the archive is in the body. Um, Saturday night. This is in Krakow. Uh, blues music was played until a DJ by a DJ until the band arrived, and the frontman said, 
see you guys dancing all slow, and we're going to speed it up. We know you can take it. They proceeded to play really fast-paced rock and roll music, and the majority of the dancers abandoned their partnerships and cleared the dance floor. The intimacy and connections established on the dance floor are almost completely evaporated. Later, I'm told the band is told to slow things down um, after the first set. A request which with they complied until they did it <laughs> and once again the floor was empty except for a few windy hoppers the following DJ commented to me that this was quote, the easiest set I've ever played after that um, as dancers were happy to have their slower paced blues music back in Krakow I was asked to dance um, a lot for like really slow um, micro dances and that tended to happen like towards the beginning of the morning so I'd get there like maybe 10 or 11 and then by like 2 3 like that was when the like my dancing was picking up which was kind of interesting um, Audre Lorde's uses of the erotic provides us perhaps with a, a useful theoretical framework for interrogating the erotic dancing body Lord argues that, quote, the erotic offers a well of replenishing and provocative forces to the woman who does not fear its revelation, nor succumb to the belief that sensation is enough, end quote. This falls in line with Kelly Brown Douglas's unabashed blues body, who lacks fear of one's sexual and sensual self. Lord warns that we have been conditioned to think of the erotic as suspect, that it is, quote, vilified, abused, and devalued within Western society, end quote. Consequently, I argue that blues dancers actively resist these constraints, allowing their bodies through their sensuality to move in ways that disrupt white supremacist social, um, imposed social order. So, this is not Krakow or Berlin, this is a little side note. Um, so, a famed uh, instructor came to Oregon and this one dancer was really thrilled and she invited me to take uh, private lessons with her and she was gushing about how this instructor had added to her dance after just one session. And in this unsolicited advertisement, um, the dancer told me about how this instructor frequently asked dancers to dance as if they were a 250 pound black woman in a juke joint. Yeah. So this contextualization of blues movement and posture through the imagined embodiment of a black woman were really um, deeply perplexing to me. And I realized that that space would be really the only thing I would be asked to imagine if that instruction were given to me. And so I decided not to take a private lesson with her. I argue that this body and this instructor projected onto herself and her students one that was powered by the erotic, a sexual and sensual black identity entity. In her white imagination, she saw the full-bodied woman that made blues what it is, however misguided and racist her proclamation. And perhaps what she wanted to access was the erotic performed by black bodies, thus I'm curious about the ways in which one might dance the erotic without erotic dancing. The next week uh, was Berlin's Blues Exchange called Bear Blues. Uh, the Thursday night prior to the event, the organizers held this fundraiser at Jocko uh, Beer Garden in Kreuzberg uh, to purchase a new dance floor. And if you can see, it's like particle board, like it's the saddest floor in the entire world. Um, so they were raising money to replace that floor. So uh, a black guy comes up to me and he asked me, um, are you Caribbean? And I'm like, no. And he's like, oh, you're American. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and he asked me if I'm a dancer, and I tell him yes. And he looks at me, and he's kind of hesitating a little bit. And he says, you need to, you need to show them. And I was like, what? He's like, you. You need to show them. And he says that uh, he's been watching them, this group of dancers, for a few weeks. And he can tell that they do what feels good, but insists that they need someone to show them. And that these dancers need something melanated up in here. In this place of exposed marginality, I feel somewhat robbed in my four years of training are, as they are made invisible by my innate ability to move as a black person and to show these white people how to dance. Um, I'm going to play you a little video in the background so you can watch this if you get bored. <laughs> this is me, this dancing. Uh... Okay, 
So Karen Hubbard argues that historically the slow drag, which I do a little bit in this video, um, you'll see like the moments where I get really close to um, my dance partner, there are kind of moments of slow drag, um, was uh, a marginally acceptable dance at the renowned dance place, the Savoy. Quote, based on a variety of, um, based on a very close hold technique and writhing hip movements in a private party setting, it tended to be practiced with the girl's arm around the boy's neck and the boy's arm placed around her waist, sometimes sliding onto her buttocks. She goes on to say that, quote, the dance was otherwise known as dancing on a dime, or more recently as the grind, and Savoy bouncers insisted that couples keep moving. For me, this points to two things, one of them being the historiographical issue of tracking an idiomatic dance that has multiple names and that is practiced over uh, time to a lot of different kinds of blues music. The next part interestingly suggests the ways in which this particular kind of intimacy was policed in the space of the soy as opposed to a juke joint or a rent party with bodies only being allowed to be uh, only allowed to be close as they were uh, perceptibly in motion. So if the, it looked like they had stopped moving, then they needed to keep moving. Um, here, the intimate erotic black body is made evident in its close embrace and slow motion, and its intimacy is resistant to alienation. So this is um, would be considered slow drag, um, which is just characterized also by like your feet sliding on the ground and not being picked up. Um, but the idea of like dancing in a really small enclosed space um, is part of slow drag. Blues queered. A short, friendly, uh, blonde presenting, uh, femme presenting person asked me to dance. Would you like to lead, follow, or switch? I tell her that I would be more comfortable following, and she jokes that she's a bad lead, but she will try. I assure her that this is fine, and I'm a bad follow, but I will also be trying. <laughs> She goes through the movement vocabulary that she feels comfortable executing as a lead, simple turns and traveling. She does not play with the rhythm of the dance much at all, and she warns me that it might be a boring dance. I tell her that I'm comfortable with this as it is later in the evening and I'm dancing with injuries. We have a really uneventful but pleasant connected dance. I will take a queer connected dance over a complicated one any time. So this is a pretty like low-key dance. How then can we begin to unlock the life world of the erotic queer dancing blues body? Jackie Malone contends that, quote, through rituals involving dance, music, song, and language, African Americans continue to find celebratory ways to evoke the spirit, and at the same time perpetuate common values, reaffirm community, and reorder society. And I think this is particularly relevant uh, when it comes to queer coupling with non-heterogeneous or non-traditional couplings uh, that occur in blues dance. And if a dance is a ritual to reaffirm community, then it is important to examine the ways in which the queer community participates and functions. And one of um, the ways in which blues can be queered is in the way that dancers pair. So having um, a, a male presenting person dancing with uh, another male presenting person, a femme presenting person dancing with a femme presenting person. Um, and some uh, dancers constantly, consciously choose to dance with uh, people whose gender aligns with their own. Other dancers who are cis women uh, choose to buck traditions that they should be like the passive resist, uh, recipients of dance by actually, um, actually asking other people to dance, uh, particularly cis men, so leading instead of following. Uh, one dancer I'm familiar with asserts her body as a queer politic by predominantly asking to lead. One dancer who identifies as a queer woman recognized the black in the Washington DC blues fusion, and by fusion I mean um, like blues dancing that is done to contemporary music, and I'll bring that up a little bit later. Um, blues uh, fusion dancing scene, and she opted to create a space that privileged the needs of queer dancers, and in many ways she queers the dance scene, veering sharply away from simple male-female dynamics, which are encouraged at larger dance events and include things such as the like Jack and Jill dancing competitions. Instead, the space that she created was made for those who could not compete in those, um, uh, in those dances and those competitions due to their orientation or their gender identity or simply the dance role that they preferred. Vita Goler offers that, quote, blues music is one of a number of creative forms through which black people transform difficulty and negativity into beauty as they maneuver through and around life's obstacles, end quote. And I think that also applies to blues dancing as well. 
Larry Neal complements this idea asserting that despite its melancholic sound, quote, the blues are basically defiant in their attitude toward life. They are about survival on the meanest gut level, end quote. What both scholars and I think many others have articulated is that blues dancing is, um, blues and blues dancing is inherently resistant. And I add that with queering the dance that it is um, making it strange or having it dance non-traditionally uh, or by queer bodies, the dance offers a more radical epistemology. And in this time of precarity uh, for many of these bodies, the act of coming together to dance and to form community constitutes a radical act. In Berlin, I exit the U-Bahn at Meringdom and I began walking south a few minutes to reach this venue called Freudenzimmer, which means the joy room. I thought that was really cool. Um, I passed by um, this famous uh, Mustafa's Gumus Kebab, which is the longest line for a food cart I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, I looked at TripAdvisor and it was like, people wait in line like two hours to get this food, which is insane to me. I didn't go there. <laughs> I just kept walking. So um, by this point, I knew or shared dances with many of these people um, in the room, receiving hugs and greeting from people as they arrived. Um, after the DJ played for a while, Four Corners, which is his band, um, who actually, it was interesting, had played in Krakow because another band dropped out. Um, but it was just uh, this young woman and uh, the guitarist. Um, but their full band was playing in Berlin, so they made a reappearance. Um, I began to listen to this woman, uh, oh, this woman, not this woman. <laughs> <laughs> this woman uh, crooning the blues. And I realized that there was really a little uh, bluesiness about what they were singing and playing when they were singing like the Jackson Fives, I Want You Back, um, as if any black performance is blues. And so I think they took the B in R&B a little bit literally um, and took it as if it didn't constitute a completely different genre. And so this concept was solidified um, when they began singing a really sultry cover of Britney Spears' Toxic. <laughs> that was real strange. Uh, around 3.15, I attempt to make my way out, and one of the organizers, I befriend it, uh, asks me, urges me to stay, letting me know that these really two awesome Spanish DJs, Los Ramones, are playing at 4, 4 o'clock in the morning. I stay. The blues room becomes a fusion room, and the fusion room becomes blues. He was right to get me to stay, um, but it was actually definitely no longer a blues exchange, and I walk back to the station as the sun comes up. In conclusion, Malone offers, um, explores how vernacular dance, quote, mirrors the values and worldview of its creators, even in the face of tremendous adversity, it evinces an affirmation and celebration of life, end quote. It is in this way that she uses similarities and cultural processes to examine how dance offers a response and potential for healing. And similarly, in highlighting these processes, Malone underscores the under-recognized potential for dance to transmit knowledge, support, or authorize change, whether it is to create home or a means of survival. It is my hope that this project has provided and will continue to provide um, some insight into the dancing life world of dancers uh, like myself, who for us is um, to dance is to thrive and proudly announce one's ability to exist and to survive and to dance the erotic in the face of those what would rather render your body and history invisible. Um, so uh, just as a like sidebar, that's kind of the end of my academic paper shenanigans. Um, but uh, part of what I did was uh, just kind of informally talking to people and asking them questions about how they um, conceived of blues dancing and blues dancing history and the like kind of real history of blues. Um, and each person had a really different concept of what blues is and some of them seemed to be kind of missing the train on what they were doing. And a lot of what people um, used that was really interesting to me uh, was this word evolving. Um, that like black people created this dance in the United States and they taught other black people that may have taught white people that taught white people that taught white people that went to Europe. And so like over time they talk about this dance like evolving as if there's like this kind of social Darwinism in cultural production that like it evolves into something better, um, which was really, really interesting to me. Um, and then the other thing I thought was super interesting and I mentioned uh, fusion dancing a couple times um, was this, uh, the kind of predominance of it because a lot of times when you have uh, blues dances, blues exchanges here, it's just like traditional blues music. 
um, and like maybe a person will play something like uh, in contemporary music that sounds really bluesy, but like for the most part, it's really um, older music. So this um, inclination to have like fusion at the end of the evening, like the last couple of hours was really interesting to me. Um, and it was interesting in that I think people used it as a way to avoid accountability as blues dancers, mm -hmm. that they um, didn't have to really think about like what the history meant or the burden of history because they weren't literally the one of the organizers of the blues dance said that she wasn't a blues dancer. She said that she was a fusion dancer. So um, I think it was a way of kind of avoiding accountability of like what the dance means, the context and this history that I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, that's what I did this summer. Mm -hmm. So we have some time for questions. Does anybody have any questions? For I have us? a question. Yeah. Uh, so you did, we're just talking about studying this in Europe. Are you continuing to do more of that stateside and looking at the comparison? Yeah, I am. Um, originally, I was thinking about like what is the difference between American dancers and European dancers in terms of like movement vocabulary. And then as I started talking to people, I got more and more invested in like how they conceived of blues and blues dancing history, and just kind of like the like you know part of what informs blues music is slavery and lynching and all these really horrible things. Um, but like for Europeans it's muted like it's they don't have that connection to like slavery and um, American history so I think there's a very different um, kind of relationship there with American dancers um, that there is possibly more respect for the origins of the dance because they can conceive of the history a little bit better so I, that's definitely something that I'm exploring and talking to um, blues dancers, I am like trying to get all over the country a little bit. Um, and you have a lot of people that travel, but I used to live in Eugene, Oregon. That's where I learned to dance. Um, I know people on the West Coast have talked to them. Um, so it'll be a process of like continuing to talk to people and continuing to dance with them. Do you have questions for us that you'd like responses on? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I guess I am curious how uh, clear like the argument for um, how the erotic powers blues um, and the like kind of relationship between sensuality and sexuality and, and blues dancing and blues um, music, um, if that's like a clear kind of argumentation. Um, and the other question is like, what did you see in that video? Like what struck you? Anything. I don't know that I have an answer to your question, yeah, yeah. but I, it does strike me, and even d you went to dance with strangers mm -hmm. um, to a place that you knew you would not know anybody, and mm -hmm. by the end of the weekend, as you said, you had built these relationships with them just by physically being close to each other mm -hmm. um, for three and six minutes at a time, mm -hmm. and I think that that's really fascinating in terms of how does eroticism show itself Bet both between people who know each other well and then people who've never met. Um, yeah, that is, that is super interesting. It also mm -hmm. leads me to something that I'm looking at kind of like in the larger dissertation project of like the, um, the effect of touch and like the kind of effective potential there of like what is generated when we touch people mm -hmm. and like what does it mean to touch people in this particular context. Um, I've I like looked at these um, researchers that think about like this idea of haptics and hapticality and like the touch of the undercommon so like part of me is curious about whether um, when predominantly white people are doing these dances if they're attempting to reproduce like the touch of black people yeah. um, as a way of like creating community and getting close to each other um, but yeah I, I think it is super interesting how uh, quickly uh, social dance in general generates community and like a sense of community. Um, in response to your question for us about the erotic and that, that argument, um, what resonated with me or what was clearest for me was the idea of 
of an erotic space being like a place where one could control mm. um, and push against um, where um, their bodies are constrained in other social spaces. Mm -hmm. That was the strongest point where that felt like a clear mm -hmm. argument for me. Um, I think in your, your bringing up um, the erotic in the terms that Audre Lorde uses it, it really made me think about how, you know, she's talking about that it's such a, it's such an individual experience. The erotic is a power for that comes from yourself and mm -hmm. from understanding yourself really well. And so I think it's so cool to see these videos where you're connecting and communicating with someone so closely that I think what you're saying about the haptic touch and this like issue of connection and can you actually share the erotic with someone else if it is so much about yourself and what are the barriers around identity for that and experience and knowledge and memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really intrigued by that part of your argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think there's something really interesting about like what you can share with other people and also like the kind of uh, ways that like coincides with movement vocabularies. Mm -hmm. So like I could dance, I was telling Patrick this um, a while ago that like I know when I'm dancing with a black person um, and similarly I know when I'm dancing with a European. Like it's distinctly different. Um, I can't like quite articulate in words how that is. Um, but it is different and it was really funny because I was like, maybe I'm just making this up But I realized I wasn't because I was dancing with this guy. I was like, oh, this feels like really familiar This feels like coming home mm -hmm. and then I talked to him and he's American and he's from San Francisco And so like Eugene Portland San Francisco Seattle people all dance the same basically and learn from the same people so like I was dancing with someone who learned to dance from the same people that I learned to dance from so um, I think kind of like identifying people's like movement dialects also mm -hmm. is a kind of way of like tapping into um, the erotic and how that is communicated um, but yeah I that was yeah super interesting to me as well I was also struck now that I'm like putting all these pieces together just about like the erotic being a confidence thing as well and mm -hmm. I was uh, did a lot of swing dance mm -hmm. in high school when you know you're finding who you are and what your confidence is and I I love that tie-in with not just being confident in your body because you are willingly putting your physical self particularly in dance and blues dancing so much of it is the hips mm -hmm. so much of our person is our hips and our core mm -hmm. and being confident enough to physicalize who you are with another person who is physicalizing who they are and the tie-in with cisgender and gender identity um, it's really it's such a beautiful kind of exploration of how do we express who we are and what does that mean and then the cultural I love it plus I just <laughs> <laughs> the, the cultural and historic tie-in too and I'm very excited to see the full thing. Yeah, I'm excited to see how it plays out. Yeah, um, I think uh, the I'm really excited about the kind of um, potential like radicalness that is occurring in these queer spaces. Um, I was just teaching in one, the same one I'm talking about uh, last night, and it was really, really wonderful. And like, it's just really interesting because I think a lot of queer people are, are used to policing their bodies in a really particular way, and they have a, a certain awareness and control of their body that actually lends itself really well to dancing. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. it's like, it's kind of sad, but also like really lovely at the same time that you can have these really mm -hmm. um, wonderful connected dances with people that are like actually settled into themselves. Um, yeah where that might not occur in other spaces. I'm curious about interplay between blues as epistemy and blues as form, and like the tensions between those things, and like is there, are there different ways that it's transmitted that isn't through like a lived in embodied experience? Is that part of the like mistranslation that's happening like through time, you know, and across racial difference? And, yeah, I don't know. I I have a lot of different hypotheses <laughs> about like what that is and where that's um, coming from. But I think the like uses um, the kind of epistemology of it 
I think is really interesting when you think about like historic context versus mm -hmm. contemporary. Mm -hmm. We talked about this a little bit that like you are talking about historically, you know, these people that have migrated from the south to the north, they're making home. Um, they're coming home from the factories and like going to the soy and going to these rent parties and these juke joints. Um, and their context is really, really different. And so what does it mean to like that they were finding respite and like relaxation in these spaces where um, contemporarily like white dancers don't have that context. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so I think that changes the form mm -hmm. and I think it changes how people move in relationship to each other. Because mm -hmm. um, like even just like being tired, like talking about swing dancing, blues dancing is often referred to as the dance that swing dancers do when they get tired. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's funny and kind of rude. Um, <laughs> But uh, just even like that informs so much of like how you move and how mm -hmm. grounded you are, like just the weight of your body. Um, you're not able to hold it up in the same way that you would need to do in like ballroom dancing or swing dancing or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but yeah. We're at the end. Great. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.